Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Caitlin Washburn. I'm the Health Beat Leader on Firearm Violence and Trauma for AHCJ. Uh, this web webinar is one of a series of topic-specific training opportunities to brief health journalists on the latest information in a particular health area and to give you story ideas or story resources you can use in your work. Today's topic is about reporting on firearm violence and specifically how to approach covering the issue through a public health lens. There has been a growing trend in journalism to change how new newsrooms cover crime, particularly gun violence, but that movement has been slow and there's been, you know, a lot of reporters have dealt with resistance in this area. Uh, the journalists on this webinar today have been a part of the effort to fundamentally change how firearm violence is covered. We will today cover what does it mean to cover gun violence as a public health issue, provide some practical tips for doing this kind of work, and also talk about the challenges we faced in, in doing this work. Um, I'd love to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have Sammy Kaola, who's a freelance reporter based in Philadelphia. We have Abane Clayton, uh, a reporter for The Guardian based in Los Angeles. Clayton works on The Guardian's Guns and Lies in America project. We also have Chris Norris, who's a strategic advisor for StoryCorps and is based in Philadelphia. Norris was the managing editor for community and engagement at WHYY. Our guests will present uh, and then answer your questions. You can ask questions at any time by typing them into the Q&A section of the webinar, and I will direct those questions to our guests. Feel free to toss them in throughout whenever they come up, but we'll have a dedicated Q&A time at the end. So I think to, to get started, we should have everyone uh, touch, uh, touch on their connection to the gun violence beat and um, the work that they've done in this space. So Sammy, why don't you get us going? Sure. Thanks so much, everybody, for being here. So up until about a month ago, I had been the gun violence prevention reporter at WHYY News in Philadelphia. I did that job for about 20 months, and it was a role that the station had never had before. We created it because Philly was experiencing really an unprecedented level of community gun violence. Um, you know, and it was concentrated in certain neighborhoods. Uh, most of the victims and perpetrators were black males in Philly. And I was tasked with really finding out what are the root causes of the problem and what solutions are we seeing on the community level, on the government level, um, and really anything that looked like it was going to really help communities get out of this crisis. And it was designed to be a really community driven beat um, Chris Norris was my boss at the time and helped design the beat that way. Um, and so, you know, I, I covered really heavily improvements to neighborhoods, improvements to the environment, programs for youth, um, programs that addressed poverty and parenting, all of these factors that, that we saw as kind of perpetuating gun violence uh, all over the city. Thank you. Thank you, Sammy. It feels only natural to kick it over to Chris to introduce yourself in the connection. <laughs> um, hello again, everyone. Chris Norris. I also go by Flood or Flood the Drummer. And I started covering gun violence around um, 2019. Um, prior to that, you know, I was covering police politics and protests. That's my main beat. I ran a digital news company called Techbook Online. Uh, I joined WHYY in November of 2019, and um, you know, right, right, right as we were filling our groove, we we ran into the pandemic, and I think the oddly enough, the pandemic was one of the best things that could have happened to that organization because it it forced it to become a little bit more nimble, a little bit more exper uh, experimental, and funders grew an interest in, in the kind of work that we were doing that were keeping people connected. And, uh, and so the second, uh, it was at that time that I was able to move um, WHYY into covering gun violence. When I first got there, it was something that they uh, didn't do, something they didn't have any interest in doing. They were concerned that telling the story of, of gun violence in Philadelphia, which is really, you know, intra-community violence, young black men uh, shooting each other, unfortunately, would alienate their core audience of, of, of high net worth, high educated, mostly white people in the suburbs. They didn't think they wanted to, to uh, experience that. But at the same time, the organization was wrestling with its own DEI goals of wanting to draw in more black audiences and be more present and responsive to black and brown audiences. And one of the things that I really pushed for 
was covering gun violence as a way to acknowledge that this is happening and this is happening to our, 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 our readers, but to cover it differently. There was enough people in the city who were doing the horse, rat, uh, horse racing kind of, of, of reporting of this person got shot here, this person got shot here, it's been two shootings this night, three people shot overnight. And that didn't help people understand how to get out of this, what to do, who to hold accountable. And so myself, uh, Melanie Roy, who was the, then the news director at this time, Katie Culinary, who was the assistant news director, and Sandra Clark, who was the VP of news now as the CEO of StoryCorps, we all got together and pushed for a gun violence prevention beat. Uh, Katie, Melanie, and I wrote the job description and, and then went out on the ad adventure uh, to find someone. And, and Sammy Cayola eventually was the, um, the reporter we hired. And exceeded our expectations for what we wanted and, and dreamed for that beat. And at the same time, we developed community conversations for television that also tackled uh, gun violence. The two that I was directly involved with were uh, Neighbors in a Crossfire, which was a four-part series, um, excuse me, a three-part series tackling that, and then Confronting the Crisis um, is another one that we did in um, collaboration with our 6ABC affiliate. Awesome. Thank you. And Abine? So, um, like Caitlin mentioned, I am a reporter at the Guardian U.S. newspaper. I'm the lead reporter on their Guns and Lies in America series, and we've been doing that project for about four years. Um, it's what I got hired to do back in 2019. I was um, finishing my degree at Berkeley's J School and doing a thesis project about where um, survivors and victims of violent crime fit into criminal justice reform. It's one where I got to talk to a gunshot wound survivor, to a mother who lost her, her child, and it was a natural progression of the hyperlocal community reporting I was doing in Richmond, um, California. So um, at that time, I was really focused on one, following up on incidents of gun violence that were covered as like kind of a local crime blotter type story to see like, well, what is this mom doing now? I got to meet people who started like clothing lines and the names of their children who were trying to go to school to talk to kids. And those stories were seldom a part of um, crime coverage. So um, I was doing a lot of that. And um, once I finished my thesis at Berkeley, um, I went on to work at The Guardian to continue that work to talk about what was and wasn't working in um, communities, what people were trying to build for themselves. And at that time in 2019, the uh, majority of the conversation in and outside of newsrooms on gun violence was focused on high profile mass shootings. And um, for me, that wasn't accurate to the experiences of people who dealt with this issue um, most over the course of several generations. So I came in as somebody to um, add nuance and to talk to folks who um, were experiencing incidents of gun violence that weren't making it to um, the national news. And I think that resonated with a lot of people, um, other journalists, especially because we've seen such you know, incredible work come out of places like the the Casey Star and the Washington Post and in recent years, and of course, WHYY in the building. So it's been really exciting to see um, people take the, um, the a similar approach to, to gun violence reporting. And um, yeah, so that's a bit about me. I'm still doing this work and also have a contributor's role on CNN, mostly about high profile mass shootings, but I'm also able to infuse some of those um, community insights when I have the opportunity to go on. Thank you. Uh, I should say my part in connection with this too. I spent two years as a gun violence reporter for the Kansas City Star. Um, and the star recognized the this work was supported by Report for America and the Missouri Foundation for Health and really what they wanted from us was to go beyond the episodic coverage of homicides. They realized that that was not an effective way of covering the issue, just showing up at crime scenes, writing a single narrative, the police narrative, and then moving on to the next one and, and not returning to that or not pulling back from it to understand, you know, what's going on here. So, um, 
myself and two other reporters, Humaira Lodi and uh, Harubi Mecco, we were tasked with understanding the causes, consequences, and and then also identifying solutions to gun violence in Missouri. And, you know, that work really took us all over. Um, my first project was on domestic violence and the way that uh, homicides in Missouri, and I specifically focused on Springfield, Missouri, um, are driven by instances of domestic violence. And so I explored that issue. We also tackled um, a lack of trust in police and the role that plays in gun violence. We covered, uh, we did a big project on public health where we took each social determinant of health and looked at the connection between that and gun violence. So, um, and you know, one my version of that was on the quote unquote built environments, but the landscape of a neighborhood. So when areas have been disinvested in and not taken care of, you know, how that breeds violence and how efforts, um, as Sammy and Chris know very well, there's a lot of uh, great efforts in, in Philadelphia around this exact issue on um, how cleaning up neighborhoods and adding green spaces can reduce violent crime. So that's an example, but we also touched on education. We touched on, um, we even touched on food insecurity and the connection between gun violence there. And in the case with Missouri being a place that is very friendly for anyone to pretty much get a gun, we did a huge project on tracing, kind of looking at the policy side of things, which um, was going back to major uh, legislation that was passed to show how, um, and in these major years, and then going forward in time and looking at how many gun deaths had happened since to show that there had been an increase as they'd rolled back regulation after regulation on guns. So um, we also, we talked, we also touched on my uh, colleague Humera did a story on um, the uneven way that even when like when it comes to possession of a firearm, getting charged and convicted on something like that, how that unfairly targets black men in Missouri. So, you know, kind of making the larger point in that story was, you know, even when there are these regulations in place, they're used to uh, criminalize gun ownership with black people and not with, and then white people get away with a lot more. And that was what she found in her, in her reporting. So we really were able to, in the two years that we did that project, we were luckily able to cover a lot of ground and um, really explore this topic deeply. And it's taught me a lot. And I now, I'm now in Chicago. I, I work for the Chicago Sun-Times and, um, you know, it really shows how uh, coverage needs to be changed on this topic and how that's, while that's a very hard task to, um, to take on, I think that what we're going to talk about today is that it is possible and um, that there's countless ideas out there and ways to do it. So um, kind of how we're going to do the show today is really just kind of, I'm going to facilitate a conversation between the four of us. And so um, I think next we should kind of pull back a little bit and talk about what does it mean to take a public health approach to reporting on gun violence? And I'd, I'd like for Chris to, to start us off there. Thanks. Uh, well, I think that the the number one thing to do is to pull from the best practices for public health in general, right? So take a look at all the other kind of uh, uh, endemics or pandemics or anything else that's happened and say, what are the best practices for health reporting when it goes from an outbreak or if it goes to you know mass shootings or any kind of virus thing? And what is really there is uh, repetition, uh, transparency, rigidness, back checking, inclusion of the medical community. Like those five pillars are how we should be covering gun violence if if we're, we're framing it as a public health issue. If we're doing gun violence stories uh, or a series of stories that's in the frame of a public health issue and you only talk to the police and gun violence survivors, you never talk to a medical professional, you never understand the implications on the system. You know, when a city is you know, over indexing in violent crime, what does that do? For the hospital services and 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 who is else is impacted outside of gun violence victims, right? Like people who are just experiencing sickness are in a hospital might be at capacity. What happens to them, right? Like when you have competing health crises happening in the city. So I think those those would be the the five things I would say is to really draw from best practices and health, and then just apply it to to journalism. Awesome, thank you. Avine, do you wanna you wanna take it on? Yeah, I think that a public health approach um, 
what first comes to mind for me is that it's markedly different than like a um, police driven or um, like kind of crime reporty approach to it. Um, I think that um, when we talk about gun violence being a public health issue, it can open up room to think about research that has to do with like what they'll call um, the upstream factors, right? So things that are around um, unaddressed mental health, especially in kids. That's something that I like to put into my journalism when I can, talking about elementary schoolers and how their mental health is affected by like their proximity to um, to shootings and to violence, talking about how um, people don't get full-fledged physical health services after they are shot and injured and how that can foment future violence. I think that when we talk about it just from a crime perspective, we limit ourselves to only being able to talk to police, but talking to like epidemiologists, to doctors, and um, of course, to people who have like survived or lost someone themselves can give us more room to think about solutions that aren't driven by solely um, incarceration and prosecution. Thank you, Sammy. To me, it really just means identifying the people that are at the highest risk of being affected by gun violence, either perpetrating it or being shot, the same way you'd address the people most likely to get diabetes, for example, um, and then figuring out what intervention could help them, right? Like we know from a study that the city did that the number one cause of, of shootings in Philadelphia is arguments. And so what's a solution for arguments? Oh, conflict resolution, which can be taught in school, it can be taught in the community setting, um, but you know, not something that the city has actually invested a lot of funding in, um, you know, people that have been shot before. So are we doing intervention again in the hospital setting? Someone just got shot. Are we dropping them into a safety net that's going to um, help them not get involved again? Are we addressing like just the toxic stress of living in a neighborhood where shootings happen every day? It weighs on people to be afraid all the time. It weighs on people to be grieving. Um, so many people in Philly have lost people, right? Every shooting has this, this ripple effect and we're not even addressing that kind of wider health and well-being impact um, with trauma services in these neighborhoods, right? So to me, it's just, it's looking at who is, who is in pain, who's been hurt, um, and how do we address that hurt and how do we prevent it in the future? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Chris, I wanna go back to you on a point, um, something when the four of us chatted a couple days ago, a point that you made was there's there's been robust public health messaging around certain illnesses and around certain issues and there's been there's been tremendous success there. Um, we haven't seen anything like that when it comes to gun violence. There's there's efforts out there, but there's not been um, and there's talk about it. But, um, you know, describe for me what an ideal like public public health messaging model would look like for for addressing gun violence and then the benefit that would have and why and the way that it's worked for other diseases, how it would work for this. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things that I forgot to say in my opening that that Abine mentioned and I want to just amplify is the research, right? Like that, that's a really big part. And I think that in any public health messaging campaign, it has to be research based or at least di driving to get to better, more to better forms of research, better pools of research. Um, I think, again, it's about best practices. So when we all remember, unfortunately, the pandemic, we can't get away from that. Um, it was it was. Um, uh, countless press conferences, countless updates. You had live tracking dashboards, right? There was there was a messaging around clean your hands, wear your mask, separate, right? Like, uh, what was that thing? Social distancing, right? There was there was nomenclature built around that. And then there was a culture that developed around that nomenclature, around that, and around those practices. And then there was satire <laughs> around all that, and all of that helped to drive narrative change, right? Because that's what we're talking about, like, is narrative change with gun violence. I think we started talking about this as, as a public health issue. I can't remember how many years ago, but we said we got to frame it as a public health issue to make more people care or because it really is. But then we just said it. 
And, and that's what you see happen in a lot of cities is you, people just say it's a public health issue and they think just saying it is enough and they don't actually have to attach any dollars to it. They don't actually have to attach any metrics or KPIs to it. There's no accountability. There's no doomsday messaging, right? If you don't do this, then X. Like It was very clear when the pandemic, if you don't wash your hands, if you don't wear a mask, if you don't social distance, if you don't stay inside, if you don't prep your ventilation, these things will happen. If you don't wear, if you don't practice safe sex, these things will happen, right? We, there's consequences baked into the messaging. What is the consequence of, of not treating gun violence as a public health issue? What's the social consequence? How much does it cost? How long lasting is it? And who's accountable for it, right? So like, those would be the things that I, I think would drive home a message. There has to be a clear consequence that this is this is what's happening to the country. These are the people that's affected. If we allow this to go on unmitigated, this will happen. Thank you. Yeah, that's a that's an excellent point, and I think can be reflected in in how we cover this. And so. In that vein, our audience today is is largely folks connected to healthcare, healthcare journalists, and so we're not expecting everyone to leave this call and go become a gun violence reporter. But um, something that again, Abine said when we chatted the other day was this is a year round beat, even if it's not your defined beat. Um, so what I'd like for us to do now is kind of get into some practical tips to to approach this topic if you. Coming with the background in healthcare, you you're you're really set to come to to approach this um, topic in your reporting. Um, so I think I think it would be good for us to go around and and touch on some practical ideas or or ways of thinking about finding stories or or even just approaching certain topics within within the large umbrella of firearm violence. And so I think I'm going to kick it to you, Abine, for starters. Yeah. Um... So when I do get a chance to like talk to other reporters, um, especially, I don't know how many people are like local kind of daily churn reporters, um, I always like to emphasize that if there does come a moment where you are covering a, um, like a local shooting or what have you, that would have been, you know, as we've mentioned, like kind of a crime blotter, not much detail type story that, um, you know, if you're asked to reach out to a, um, a police public information officer, you should also have the number of like a violent interventionist. Um, in a lot of cities, there is always at minimum one or two people who show up to the scenes of shootings, whether they're a chaplain, whether they're, um, you know, I know a lot of moms who do that to go and kind of comfort other people, of course, other violence interrupters will will show up to these scenes to um, stop immediate retaliation. And you should make it a point to have one of their numbers so you can call them in the aftermath and get that other perspective. That's something that um, I have found to be a relatively um, easy lift. And it can also produce more stories because you have a relationship that, um, you know, not everybody thinks of as valuable as having like a police source or something like that. Um, another thing, if you are a, a healthcare journalist, you are so well equipped to know, you know, what long-term care can look like for somebody. I think we talk a lot about, um, you know, after somebody has uh, a surgery, how important it is to, to make sure there are no um, infections, to make sure that they have proper, like if they need a bed that like sits up, there are all of these ways to make sure that after someone is injured or after someone has an operation that they're taken care of. And that is a big gap in um, for gun violence victims. You know, I've talked to a lot of folks who have had to rely on, um, had to rely on like community sources and like GoFundMe accounts because they didn't have health insurance or the the hospital they went to didn't have um, resources they could send them to that were specific to somebody who was dealing with a gun injury that come uh, excuse me a gunshot wound that means physical and mental scars. Um, I think the mental health aspect and the really struggling is the is the best way I can put it right now way that um you know America's mental health ecosystem is we are understaffed in a lot of places um not super culturally informed in a lot of places and I think that's something healthcare journalists are like uniquely able to tackle um and with Caitlin mentioning that it is a year-round beat I mean you know if there is a shooting perhaps 
put it on your calendar, follow up with that person in a year. And that's an excellent way into um, informing your readers or your viewers about the shortcomings in their medical, in their local kind of medical system. And that is a benefit to everybody, but it's also a way to talk about the realities of gun violence to hold your local um, leaders, to hold um, healthcare executives accountable. And it's something that you don't exactly have to be, you know, super well informed about all of the drivers of gun violence to do, but as a way to infuse these truths into um, all of your stories. And um, like Caitlin mentioned, like everyone isn't gonna leave and like implore their newsrooms to start a gun violence beat. That might not be your passion, but I think thinking more about ways that um, the topics you cover every day intersect with gun violence is a really helpful practice in um, expanding what you talk about yeah, absolutely. Uh, Sammy, you want to go? I think a best practice for really any beat, but especially gun violence, is to build community listening into your work. Uh, so in my case, Chris encouraged me to take a two-month listening tour of neighborhoods in Philadelphia where gun violence was most common. So that meant going to vigils and town halls and protests, not necessarily to do a story, but to meet people, to introduce myself, to actually set up a table and ask, hey, what do you think the solutions to gun violence should be in Philly? Or, hey, how would you like to see this issue covered by WHYY? And I did end up writing some stories during that tour, but mostly I got to know people and those people ended up being folks I could call in a breaking news situation or folks that would call me with a really important tip. For example, I started to hear that this grant program that the city of Philadelphia had set up was supposed to distribute millions of dollars to mostly grassroots mom and pop gun violence prevention groups, that the money was not being distributed in a way that worked for them. They had to kind of spend their own money and then get reimbursed and the reimbursement was really slow. And, you know, we were able to track all that through documents and through interviews with the city. Um, and then eventually we did a solutions piece that was like, here is a funding model that would actually allow these groups to, to do the work that, that you want them to do. Um, but you have to change all of the red tape that you've set up as part of this grant process. And the city actually changed it. Um, about two, three weeks after that story came out. So, you know, it's hard to say if they were planning to do that anyway, but I think our coverage really pushed them. I wouldn't have even known that that was a problem um, if these community groups hadn't reached out to me about it. So, you know, it's it's any kind of shoe leather reporting. Um, you just got to build in the time. And if you can't take a month to go and, and just listen, maybe it's once a week you find an event in a neighborhood where this problem is occurring and, and you just go. Um, it's, I think it's really about showing up. Thank you. Chris, you wanna take it? Yeah, just quickly to, to amplify what, what, what Sammy said, I can't emphasize how important it is to show up and just be present. And um, when I, before I joined WHOI, when I was running my own shop, I was front and center at protest, at funerals, I was calling mothers who lost their kids to on Mother's Day, just checking in because it was I was part of the community. And I'll never forget when I was at a town hall and it was all the TV media, everybody was there, and it was a portion of the event that was open. And then the the the, the community wanted the, the media to leave because so they couldn't really talk. So they asked the media to leave. And I was I was sitting down and I remember the Fox 29 reporter goes, Well, how come how come Flood gets to stay? And one of the organizers from the state said he's a member of the community, right? And and he made that he created that delineation that Flood is a member of the community who does acts of journalism, but you guys are here for work. He's here because he's part of the community. And so I think that community engagement piece is like a lot of times we talk about how do we build community engagement into a newsroom, and it's like no journalism is community engagement. You don't you're not supposed to be building in this. It's a part of the function of what you're doing. If you're not building community, you're just producing content, right? Journalism is, is inherently about being in the community, understanding sources, talking to people, getting to know them, building that relationship, and then diversifying your sources. And I, I think that um, the biggest tip that I would give outside of showing up is when you show up, acknowledge what you don't know and be curious. 
and ask questions because the community are the experts and, and journalists really like to believe sometimes that, you know, we're, and, and rightfully so, right? We're doing righteous work, but sometimes we can come as, we can come across as condescending and elitist and think that what we're doing is, is, is so much beyond anyone else's comprehension. And communities know when they hear bad coverage and when they hear bad ideas and when they see racial, racial you know, uh, 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 through lines and stories. So, you know, knowing what you don't know, ask that, but also ask, how do you feel I'm doing so far? How do you feel the coverage in this city has been going? Is there any red flags that you want to talk about? What what the last gun violence story you, you read or saw? How did it make you feel? What what did you hope was there? Is there any way that I can do better? And kind of building that check in with your your sources, your poor people, you know, every quarter or so, having that brain trust, I think is really important. Yeah, and I think a huge part of that too, what you're talking just with showing up is. How can you expect a community to trust you if all you're there for is collecting content and leaving? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you're not showing that you care about this issue and that you're then, um, you know, the whole point of, you know, you're asking something of them, like, why should they, why should they trust you? And especially on a topic where most for the, for people who live in neighborhoods impacted by gun violence um you know they're usually only seeing a reporter when that that mm -hmm. reporter is sent out to knock on doors after a shooting that happened down the block if you're not also showing up like sammy said at community events or um you know making it clear that you're interested in this community outside of when tragedy happens then they care more to come and tell you your story their story and what i have found too in that piece of what chris said is that humility of like Mm. both acknowledging your own you know what you don't know but then also the failures of the industry like you don't have mm. to you don't have to carry the sins of of everything <laughs> our, our industry has gotten wrong on this topic however you should acknowledge how you know how bad coverage of this has contributed to the problem mm. um and i think and in that piece too and in that prevention side like we're not responsible for preventing gun violence from happening. However, if we're covering it responsibly and we're talking about um, ways that it can be prevented or even talking to the people who who live with it every day and what they say should be done, like their voices matter just as much. And I think another lesson that I learned in the public health approach is when I wrote about suicide, I did a, I did a three-part series on that. And I think something that that it, I didn't know it before I wrote about it, but uh, two thirds of gun violence or of gun deaths are suicides. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and what Abine was saying about how this issue intersects with every topic and it intersects mm -hmm. with mental health in a big way. And, um, you know, you'd also be surprised to dig into who now are victims of suicide. And it's not the stereotype of an older white man with a gun anymore. It's um, like black youth in particular are dying by suicide at alarming rates. And I found that in Missouri many mm. times over. And I think that's, that's, there's a lot of great prevention work out there. And, um, you know, especially around just in in homes with young people who are in crisis where there's a gun present just knowing that by locking that gun up or um mm. keeping separating the ammo from the gun and keeping them both locked separately or understanding the risk that that weapon poses in the home um is just like that's a great example of prevention and there's plenty of people to talk about that as well because it's in the same way that uh a shooting is an act of hopelessness and despair sometimes it's the same thing with it's the same risk with suicide mm. so, yeah that's can I, can I can i raise something yeah uh, here uh you know when we you know when we all connected i think it was friday or thursday whenever we talked um you know uh <laughs> I mean, we said we could have recorded that that could have been a conversation but uh it was it was a conversation point we talked about in abonnet um uh, I, I can't remember how we framed it, but anyway, it was it was we were talking about the fact that um, this country has very easily mobilized itself, uh, both socially and politically, to um, resist and um, be outraged by mass shootings. And we have convinced ourselves that the mass shootings that happen are actually the public health crisis and not the shootings that happened in Oakland and Philly and Baltimore and Atlanta and Chicago and Detroit. 
and in Richmond, Virginia, right? Like we we for whatever reason, and I think some sometimes we know the reason. Like it's it's certainly uh, cultural, racial, and class uh, among other other things. But the we have created the intellectual uh, infrastructure to think about this issue of mass shootings critically. We could talk about banning AR-15s, we could talk about limiting magazines, we could talk about background checks and age requirements and all these other types of things, but none of that, when I hear all that, none of that gets to doing anything about the shooting at 23rd and Tasker or 28th and Lehigh. Like, that's not the issue. There are two separate but parallel gun violence crisis is happening in, in this country. There are the mass shootings that almost, uh, that are very uh, infrequent in context. Uh, they're often performed by white men and they often impact uh, whiter communities. And then there's the intra-community violence that happens much more frequently that impacts black boys and men almost exclusively between 15 to 28. And we have not really put any brain trust around that, even though that's the one that's happening at a really frequent scale. So when we talk about the public health crisis and you talk about in the context of sickness, who's getting sicker the most, who's getting sickest the fastest, where is it spreading and how do we tackle it? And for whatever reason, we put all of our in, in attention and, and resources around one or the other and we're making people choose. My point is we shouldn't have to choose, but the reality is there is one that is happening that requires a lot more urgency. And I think because it impacts black or brown people, it doesn't get the the, uh, the intellectual rigor or the attention or the political will. Yeah, absolutely. I did have another question, but I wanna give Sammy and Abine another chance to, if you guys had something else you wanna say on this issue, because I think this is really an important part of, of why we're, why the four of us are talking today is, is how to cover this and and what our lessons learned are. I mean, I just would um, just kind of bouncing off of what um, Flood said. I hope it's okay that I call you Flood. I've been waiting uh -huh. for like four days <laughs> for my moment and to be bold enough to call you Flood and now I'm doing it. So um, I think that, you know, the kind of violence that a lot that we are talking about on this panel, intercommunity violence, mainly affecting um, young Black boys in these communities, is an issue that um, has been completely given over to police and sometimes mm. prosecutors. You know, there's not a really it's very difficult to know how often people are being arrested and prosecuted for these things because they're so um, police and, and prosecutorial systems are so disjointed. But this is a problem that, you know, unfortunately, a lot of our readers will see and be like, well, why are you talking to a doctor about this? Like, well, what does a teacher or a school have to do with it if it wasn't a school shooting? Because, you know, we have this uphill <laughs> battle to, um, you know, kind of reclaim, if you will, gun violence as a true public health emergency. It's something that when I talk to people, it still seems a little like niche or like this new idea that's like, oh, wow, like there's something emergency room physicians can do, like, excuse me. And, and then you get into all of these conversations around fear, you know, it's like the people that we are covering, the folks that a lot of the violence interventionists that I talk to um, are supporting, Folks are afraid of the people in those communities coming into their wider, more upper middle class neighborhoods and um, subjecting them to the same violence folks have been dealing with for years. So as we talk about what um, reporters can do, I think it's important to recognize where we're at in this conversation and um, realize that you have to address these Fears. Like we did a lot of myth busting, if you will, in like 2020 and 2021 about community gun violence. There was this assumption that the communities where this were happening, was happening was like, oh, they've just been waiting for this moment of COVID and public unrest to just shoot everyone in their communities. Like that was really the idea that people were taking advantage of a, a pandemic to shoot each other in their communities. And that is because we only hear from police on these matters. So I just wanna underscore how important it is for healthcare journalists to really um, you know, kind of get into the game because people assume that we're just um, like caping for, for shooters a lot of the times. And, and I hate to put it in such kind of crass terms, but like that is the news environment that we're in. It's one of 
fear and one of the assumption that mass shootings are gun violence in America. Um, and not that there are these very preventable, um, and not that it's a buildup of these very preventable shootings that like, sorry, I don't recall, if, I think it was um, Sammy who said like, it's conflicts, right? It's people who are in these situations where they feel like their back is up, up, up against the wall. A lot of the times, unfortunately, that their manhood is being tested and they're deciding to use a firearm. And a lot of the times we don't ask why. And I think that healthcare journalists are like uniquely positioned to ask those questions to people who aren't police. <laughs> and that's just what we have to do. Um, so they are a little passionate on that one, but um, I don't know. Flood just brought up some <laughs> emotions in me, but thank Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, you I, know, just really, really quickly, 60 seconds of, of what yeah. Ebony said is like, again, if we're talking about feminists as a public health issue, and then everybody who, you know, for the most part that is involved in this, this, this gun violence is reverted to the courts after they, you know, get out of the jail. I mean, excuse me, after they get out of the hospital and they, they, they get their wound cleared. You know, they're, they're sent to court and, and, and who follows up with them from the emergency room after they left to see if they, again, when you start talking about health, the, the, I think about gun violence as a virus that you have to contain and you have to mitigate it by, by, by uh, quarantining it, right? Extracting it so that it doesn't spread. So if somebody comes into a hospital and they've been impacted by gun violence or infected by gun violence and they're treated and released back out in the world, who follows up with them to see if they've been uh, infected again or if they're back into a community that has a contagion? These are the kind of things you have to think about if you're going to frame it that way. If you're not, if we're not going to treat it like a public health issue, that's fine. Let's just stop saying it. <laughs> but if you're going to, then these are the things you should do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Sammy, is there something, anything you would like to add? No, I just actually peeked at the Q&A and there's a question in there that I would be excited to address awesome. if we're at that part. We I was just going to encourage folks, we do only have one Q&A question at the moment. So if you could please, if you've got any, direct them to that tab. Um, that's the best place for us and for me to, to direct these questions towards our panelists. I like that question and I want to come back to it. Um, my kind of final question here is we've all dealt with challenges on this beat in our own ways, whether it's internal or it's on the job out reporting. Um, so I'd, I'd like to talk about that too, because we've, we've kind of mentioned it throughout, but I think um, uh, we can all agree that when leadership doesn't support making a change on, on coverage like this, it's very hard to make that change, even when you have a bunch of eager journalists who are very willing to, to do the work and to show why that work's valuable. Um, so I would like a chance to, to talk about the challenges and, and I myself face challenges, like, you know, in, in the project that I did, it was only two years, you know, in an ideal world, I'd still be doing that work in Missouri, but it kind of just doesn't work out that way when there isn't isn't that leadership support or that desire to make this a long-term change because it it can be scary and we're talking about altering a way that an issue that has been covered the same way for a very long time which is just this episodic nature of the coverage and, and focusing on the law enforcement voice and perspective on this issue and it takes a lot to make that change so um i'd like to open it up to you know what what are the challenges that that we've all faced and i can kick it to you sammy if you'd like yeah i i feel very passionately that to cover this beat well newsrooms need to give reporters space and time um, not only to not do episodic shooting coverage, but also to not do, you know, one day or two day stories really of any kind. I mean, sometimes there are reasons if something is happening really urgently to do something quickly, but a lot of the work that I think makes change really takes time to develop. Like that piece I talked about with the grant funding, it took, it took weeks to interview all of those nonprofits and to dig up that data and to get to the bottom of, of where the snag was. When I work with young people in Philadelphia, they have to trust me. Like they're not gonna tell me why they're involved in gun violence or what their story is. If they don't know who I am, I'm just some white lady, right? Like I need to keep 
going to where they are and, you know, convince them that I care about them. And like, that's not something that you can do when you're doing two or three stories a week. Um, and, you know, when Chris ran the gun violence beat, you know, we, we did stories that we felt were, were meaningful and in depth and, and community informed. Um, and then, you know, eventually it, it got to be that the news demands in my newsroom increased and I was supposed to do more stories of what I felt were of less substance. Um, and I was also directed away from telling community driven stories and more toward policy stories. And now like policy is a component of this and, and it's important to cover some policy, but it can't be the whole beat. And for example, like legislation that you know, limits the number of AR-15s that someone can buy. Um, that's great for stopping mass shootings, but most of the intra-community violence in Philadelphia is committed with handguns, right? So it's it's that disconnect that Chris was getting at before, like why are we focusing on this, this smaller subset and not the policy that could save really thousands of lives in Philly? And so, you know, that's my note if you're a manager, um, really give your reporters the space and time to figure out um, who's being affected and why and what stories could make change. Thank you. I'd like Chris to answer this too, because you were an editor and, and you kind of had that, you know, I think have we're a bunch of reporters, but to have the editor perspective on this, I think is also important. Yeah. I mean, look, you know, all management is not created equal. <laughs> and, you know, just like with the presidential term, you know, when an administration comes in, they bring with them a set of values and a set of priorities, or in this case, an editorial agenda. And you would hope that at some point, some of these things would be rooted in the institution, but that's not always the case, right? It's, it's, Whoever's in that chair next may want to do it and may, may, may not. I mean, that's what you see at WHYY now is a kind of a dissolution of a lot of the community-based work that we did. It doesn't seem to be a priority anymore for whatever reason. But I think, you know, what I would say in terms of advice is be unrelenting. The same way you pursue a source, be unrelenting in pursuing this as, as an infrastructure of your newsroom. Um, make it clear in your pitch that this aligns with your outlets, um, public service commitments, right? Like if it's, if it, if we're framing it as a public health issue and this is something that communities should be concerned about, then we're doing a public service. And this is, this is just as important as what legislation passed in city council or how much the governor approved for new railroad infrastructure or, or you know, or what to do this weekend in, in an aggregated roundup. Like this is part of a public service. We should care about who's being affected in our communities because as we know in the public health context, if the virus is not contained and where it's happening in the hotspot, it will eventually go to where we think are the safe neighborhoods, right? And, and that's when it gets, it metastasizes out of control. So be unrelenting and, 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 and making sure that the pitch aligns with what the editors and the managers care about. Talk about how it's a novel, how could be the novelty of it, how could bring in new funding. You know, talk about how it diversifies audiences and diversifies sources. Talk about how it diversifies your content or, uh, and creates pipeline to new programming opportunities. Those buzzwords that they like to, that they understand, you got to use that too. Thank you. Albany? Yeah, um, I always feel like I got a pretty lucky break with my newsroom leadership. And I think they're excellent examples of being willing to like, like Sammy said, let your reporter have space and time. When I came on to The Guardian, I hadn't really written like daily news, turnaround stories and things of that nature. I was really used to writing these like meaty, almost investigative features. And my editor was like, cool, that's what you do. Take the time to, to do that. And not all of them were like the most read things on the site for that day. Some of them like took two months to report out and like got... 20,000 page views, which for The Guardian is, um, is is pretty low when you have some breaking news stories that get like a million hits, like 20,000 can make you like almost feel bad about yourself. But I think we knew that we were building up a body of work that um, was valuable and necessary in its existence. You know, um, I always go back to this assumption that the communities that experience gun violence the most are like, people assume they're either completely apathetic to shootings or that they are like 
actively fueling the the violence amongst themselves. And I think what, you know, having the space and time for years to to do these stories has done is like create a like book of receipts that says, no, that is not the case. That's what y'all assume time and time again, but that's absolutely not the case. And you can't do that if you're only given like six months for an entire project, or if, you know, you want to pursue these stories, but you're never given time and you're expected to like do it on your off hours. Like that's a, a terrible idea. Like you should be given your working hours to complete these very important stories. And um, I think it takes newsroom leadership being willing to to deviate maybe, maybe from what they're like other competitors are doing around this subject to be willing to, um, I just can't emphasize the time enough to like go, yeah, go to the the vigil, go to that rally that's in the middle of the day. Yeah, go speak to this room of like 10th graders, you know, go and, and check out what this violence intervention group is doing with a community garden. And a story might not come out of it and you have to be okay with it because it's serving um, a kind of larger purpose if you will. And I think that's something that regardless of how much a, a reporter wants it and sees the value, if they're not backed by leadership or if everything is like, well, that story didn't do that well, we're never doing it again. Like that's just, that's not gonna work. And it's just, um, it's disheartening and has the potential to push really talented people away from a beat that desperately needs reform. So if there are any editors in the house, please um, you know, heed these wise words. Heed them indeed. I think of something that we keep talking about a conversation the four of us had that the folks watching weren't a part of, but something that Chris had said was, um, I think it was you, but this this should be a value driver, not a revenue model or not something that is decided on because of page views or because of clicks. Like this is something, this should be something that, yeah, value driver is just such a great way of putting it. This is how you should approach your coverage. This is how you should think about approaching gun violence. And this is, it, you you serve in, in all the buzzwords Chris list, listed off too. It's, you know, you're, you, you, you do right by your readers and by your newsroom. It just, it's kind of a win-win. Well, thanks everyone. I want to um, leave some time. We've got some questions coming in. I want to encourage people to keep sending in questions. Um, we've got one that I think I'm going to have Sammy start with is, uh, can panelists offer tips for approaching and speaking sensitively with survivors of gun violence and family members of survivors and descendants? This is an excellent question. And I think your head's already in the right place to be asking it. So go ahead, Sammy. Yeah. Thanks for this question. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this because as a journalist, you can create further harm for somebody who's already in uh, a state of trauma and you need to be really cognizant of the labor that it takes for somebody to revisit something painful, uh, such as losing a loved one to a shooting or maybe even being shot themselves. And so I was fortunate to take a week long training with the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma in July. And there's a framework that they taught us that, that I love to share because it's really helped me. It's four things. It's safety, closure, reflect back, and control. Um, and there are a lot of ways to hit those four boxes. Safety can be as simple as, where do you want to talk to me? Do you want me to come to you? Oh, no, you don't want to do this with your kid in the house. Okay, do you want to meet me at my house? Um, do you want to have somebody with you? Do you want to have a friend? Do you want to have um, perhaps a, a counselor? Can we go to a space where we have a mental health person who could be available? Um, things about control have to do with maybe I'm going to call you before this comes out and I'm going to read back to you what you said so that you don't have to feel afraid of what is going to publish. Now, that is not something we would ever offer to a politician, right, or somebody in power. This is something I offer to people who are vulnerable, who may be telling me something while they're in a state of grief or shock. And so I actually do want to circle back to them and say, hey, here's how I characterized what you told me. Um, are you still okay with telling me that? Did I get it right? And if I didn't get it right, what's not right about it, right? Um, for some people, it's a matter of safety. Oh, actually, please don't include that detail because um, somebody who's after me will find me, 
right? We need to be so careful about these things. Um, so yeah, and I'm, I'm always happy to share more on that, but somebody once told me, this was at the same training, you wouldn't, if you're a surgeon, you wouldn't run into the OR after like eating a hamburger in your car without washing your hands and start doing surgery, right? As a journalist, you should not be running to an interview with a gun violence survivor without thinking these things through. Absolutely. Abhinay, you want to answer that too? Yeah, I spend um, probably most of my reporting time talking to like the parents and siblings of people who have been killed, usually about their experiences with like victim services or other like infrastructure, you know, courts and police, that sort of thing. And whenever I'm going into these conversations, I think Sammy um, underscored a lot of important things about just the level of like control that person should have. It's like, what time do you want to talk? It's sometimes it's like, look, I'm working from nine to like seven. I can only talk on the weekends. And that and that just has to be okay, you know, um, of course, given, you know, you figure out your own, your schedule, but I think that the comfort of the survivor victim that you're talking to is just of the, the utmost importance. So of course, like the location and timing, leaving it in their hands, like as much as you can is key. When I start these interviews, um, I always, I like to ask like for the person to one, like, let's start by what, what were some of your favorite things about this person? What are some things that I absolutely like have to know? I seldom if ever jump in with like, what happened to your person? And when there does come a moment that you need to ask, of course, about the death, I always frame it as like, what, what was your day like that day? You know, like, what was your experience of the day your loved one was killed? And um, I, I didn't always do that. And when at first it was like, yeah, I don't know. It just, when I would just ask like, oh, what happened to your loved one? I just feel like it evoked, um, a, it, it kind of put a barrier between me and the other person. I feel like I ended up kind of sounding like, you know, the police officer who's taking their statement or like as a, a random prosecutor or something like that. And I always like to center the person who I'm actually talking to versus being like, what happened to your loved one? It's like, what was your day like that day? And it all kind of it ends up coming out, you know what I'm saying? But, um, and and on that note of asking about, you know, the incident only, I make sure I take, um, if there are any follow-up questions I ask them in that moment, I let them talk for as much as they can, but I make sure I get the timelines, the day, everything right. So we only have to have that conversation once. Um, I try to make that the main like serious moment. It's like, okay, well, and if there's stuff you can get from like police reports, please do that because you don't want to keep asking somebody like, oh, and, and you said they were wearing red shoes or what was left in the bedroom. Like, you don't want to, you don't want to do that until maybe that kind of fact check, fact check conversation. Um, but in that moment, asking about that incident, you just want to be so careful, you know, and, and be careful for yourself. You know, one thing um, I've learned, I know that wasn't a part of the question. Like I, if I can I don't I, I don't interview a, a survivor or victim more than one in a day um if I'm doing a story that I know I'm gonna have to talk to multiple parents or multiple loved ones I space it out you know I my personal struggle with like this beat has come from my own vicarious trauma and just not taking care of myself and being like absolutely have to do this because no one else will and just kind of breathlessly collecting these deeply traumatizing stories without actually thinking about the impact they were having on me. So for your own well-being, if you can limit your really intense interviews to one a day and make them as like high quality as possible, keep the person on the phone for as long as you can, because victims and survivors, their priority is not you and your story. So following up and texting all the time, like that's just not, that's just not going to work. People are living their lives. A lot of these folks um, that I've talked to, they have like other kids, you know, so their entire life, unlike ours, is not going to be about this story for two weeks. So make those interviews as quality as possible. And um, always ask like, you know, what their feelings on the reporting of their loved one was, because a lot of the time folks will tell you 
that um, they felt like their kid was described as like a, um, a criminal who was deserving to die pretty much, that their lifestyle led them to this moment. And what a lot of parents um, I have found want to do, like I call it um, like posthumous exoneration, when they're like, make sure you tell them that my kid wasn't this, that other third, make sure that they know they loved animals, they dressed their you know little sibling for, uh, for school every single day. And those details are so important to folks um i saw a like a, a question in the in the chat that was like about impact things making change and sometimes the the most you can offer as a reporter like you might not get a law changed or get a murder solved but the level of dignity that is reclaimed for these families is something that you know, the justice system can't really do, isn't always something that a mental health professional can do, but through your like care and your intentionality in um, interviewing is something that is, um, is achievable and is incredibly valuable, even if it's on this micro level. And I think like Sammy said, going in prepared, like you don't wanna be running in and go, I have to do this real quick. My mind is scattered all over the place. Like you're not gonna get the best results for yourself or for that for that victim who it may have taken everything in them to trust a reporter again. So we have to really be, um, yeah, we have to be really serious and intentional about how we approach folks. Cause it's not, it's, it's no small thing to be willing to talk about the literal murder of your child, which a lot of these folks do. Yeah. I think you both raised such really important and valuable points. And I think one thing that you were talking about with that, that, telling the story of the whole person. Um, people are eager to talk about their loved ones. And if you show up with just as much of an interest in learning about who that person was, they're going to, they're going to trust you and they're, they're going to feel safe. And, you know, most importantly, you're going to get the story right. You're going to get who this person was. And I think coming with both of the tips that they, uh, you know, coming with armed with all of that, but then also just I have found you get you get a long way when you show a genuine interest in learning who this person was and making it about them and you know what's happened to them is a part of their story and it's a part of why you're talking you're unfortunately having to talk to this loved one but you know it's it it doesn't just define that person it's not that one thing and I think making it clear that you understand that and then to humanize who these victims are for the people who then read this story um, goes a long way toward, you know, people understanding that this is a problem that impacts the entire community and therefore them, even if it's not something that they have to live with and just reminding them of that. Chris, did you have anything you wanted to share on the point? Oh, I mean, I think they, they covered it both really nicely. Um, I'll just add my personal experiences you know, I used to do morning radio, live radio every every morning, and I would sometimes bring on the mothers to, to to talk, you know, live, which is much more harder than just being in their home and them talking into your phone or your note, your note app. But what I would do is kind of what what Sammy says, you know, and I would do this live on air is I would say, OK, we're getting ready to go live. We're going to have this conversation at any point that you feel like you can't or don't want to continue. Just tap my leg. We'll go to commercial break. Take deep breaths in between your stories. If you feel like you don't want to go there, just say no. There's no pressure at all. Uh, remember, the audience is here, but you can't see them. But they support. They're supporting you. And and then and then I would start with the asset framing, right? Which is what we talked about. Like you know, state the best and before the rest is the concept of asset framing. And and so like, tell me you tell me about this. Tell me what he was like. What did he like to do? What is his favorite food? You know, whose house did he go to on Thanksgiving? You know, like like set a baseline. And then say, you know, then I would say, are you ready to tell me what happened? Should we go to commercial break first and let you take a few minutes? Or do you, okay, let's go to commercial break, right? Like just making them feel like they have full, complete control over this, this process and, and really humanizing um, their loved one. I'll never forget Brandon Tate Brown, um, young man shot on the day after my birthday, December 15th, 2016 in Philadelphia, shot in his back while he was running away from a cop. And, uh, and I got to meet his mother at, at the first protest. I'll never forget, she was like a deer in the headlights. All these people were around her with these cameras asking her questions. And you could tell like she wasn't even there. Like she was there physically, but her mind was completely gone. And I just did not feel comfortable being a part of that. So I didn't join the gaggle of reporters. I, I set it out and, and I let them get what they were going over to. And then I remember walking up to her after that was over and I said, are you okay? 
you know, like that was probably really rough for you. I said, I'm, you know, I'm a journalist. I said, I don't want to talk to you right now, though, because I feel like you need to come down. But I would love to be able to tell your story in full. Um, here's my number. When you feel like you're up to it, let's talk, right? And what she, we wound up connecting. And what, what we did is she, she called me the day before the funeral and said, I'm going to give you this interview and I want you to run this story on the morning that I put my son in the grave. And I want the, I want the city to read that before the funeral. And I felt such a weight of responsibility uh, on that, but it also spoke to the level of, of trust and people, those small compassionate things, it really goes a long way. So when you could tell someone, you know, I see that this, you know, look, I have a deadline, the story is important, but it's not as important as you being re-traumatized and going to that, you know, at the end of the day, this newsroom is not going to collapse if we don't get this story, right? I want to make sure that you are okay. So I'd like to, I'd like to tell this story, but I'd like to do it when you're ready. And just be, just remembering that it's so easy when you're in the newsroom and even easier when you're a reader to just, these names are just headlines. They are not real people. It's easy to just be removed from that. But you have to remind yourself and center yourself in that shared humanity and go, this is a person going through the absolute worst period of their life. And they have cameras in front of their face and they're being asked questions about how do you feel? How do you think I feel? You know, like, how would you feel if this was your mom or your aunt and approach it that way? Well said, everyone. Um, so we've got a few questions coming in, and I think we should um, rapid fire a couple of them, kind of maybe go one person. Um, we've got one here that I think is really interesting um, and important. This one challenge for me in reporting has been the distrust of gun, gun owners. I was going to call it a gun owning community, as well as a subset of highly militant Second Amendment absolutists who can be threatening as well as armed. How have you dealt with this in reporting and strategizing the beat? Anyone interested in taking that one? I think, um, I mean, reporting in Missouri, I really, I encountered a lot of different types of gun owners. And I think that, you know, they are often left out from this conversation. And, you know, the who a gun owner is, is also not only, it's it's also who we think they are is, is oftentimes a stereotype. And um, especially when we're talking about the people who live in communities who deal with gun violence. Like I've talked to many people who feel like, who just have felt like they have no choice but to own a gun to feel safe where they live. Um, and so I think we miss a lot of the, there was an interesting thing that Trace I think did recently. I think it was them where they were just talking about the changing demographics of gun owners. And it's a lot of people who are, you know, the the fact that it used to be something it was like, it's just about hunting and then it became about self-defense um with stand your ground and concealed carry but um there's a subset of gun owners now who where it is just to feel safe to feel safe where they live or to feel like their um their person is at risk of being attacked like if the 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 story had broken down you know um both black people but also people um of the lgbtq community and um anyone who feels like they their identity is a threat to others and that they feel they have to to protect themselves. So I'm not fully answering your question, but I think it's worth, it's really worth talking to gun owners on this issue. I don't think it's, it's smart to leave them out because there's no, like that's, you're, you're missing a very valuable part of this. And even if it's something you don't, it's a great exercise. And if you don't personally believe in gun ownership, you know, I think it's a great, um, it's a great exercise for yourself and for your readers to to talk to these people and not necessary to amplify you know your your second type of person this kind of this absolutist these like fringe people who um don't make up a lot of the community there's a very small percentage you know so always be careful with with talking to those folks but i think i think you would be surprised if you really explored who owns guns and why they own guns um i think it's a it's a valuable part of this this issue Um, this is a good one. Uh, what would you say to young people who say, what's the point in doing this? Nothing ever changes. Maybe you have examples of how your coverage led to change. Um, Sammy, would you like to take that one? I'll start. It's something that I hit so often with reporting. I feel like I was coming to these kids with, with nothing for them. Um, but what I eventually came to tell them was that like maybe the world isn't changing right now. Maybe Philadelphia isn't changing right now, 
but that like you can change, right? Like you as yourself, you can, you can have a future that you want to have and not just the one that you feel has been prescribed to you by society. And the reason that I felt I was able to tell them that was because there was so much going on in Philadelphia in terms of youth, um, you know, education and programming and employment and, and therapy. And like, there are actually a lot of resources and there are places for these kids to be, even if their home environment is not safe, if their neighborhood is not safe, um, there are, there are community groups, resource centers where they can be. Um, and so I've, I've just tried to point them in that direction. I mean, a lot of these kids, I've met them through these programs, right? So they're, they're already connected. So it's a matter of, of encouraging them to stay connected. Um, but, you know, it's really hard for them in Philly because it's also a city where we're putting curfews in place. We are putting bans on the full face coverings, sometimes called shysties that are a part of, um, you know, what, what youth wear. We are uh, really doing a lot of villainizing of young people. Um, so I don't know. My hope is just that by actually talking to young people, um, and actually trying to see them for who they are and where they are. And as, as young people who have a ton of potential that, that that can change their, their mindset. Um, but you know, it also, now that I'm saying it sounds totally pie in the sky. So please somebody else jump in. Anyone else want to take it? Well, you know, I used to be a teacher and, uh, taught K through three and I taught high school and I've also mentored and continue to mentor young black men. And, um, and I was one of those young black men at one point who did not think anything could change, right? And got so unbelievably angry. I was just telling a friend of mine how far I've come because if I remembered myself at 22 and I just was unbelievably angry, you know, I don't know how, I, I, I cringe when I see my Facebook post memories come up from that era and I hit delete. I was like, man, I was, I was saying some things. But I think, you know, one of the things that I would tell a young person is, is uh, and, and this is the best practice to talk with anyone who's expressing some kind of displeasure is acknowledge their feelings first before you try to convince them that change is possible and say, you know what, you're probably right. You know, things can't change, but wouldn't it be worth to try anyway, right? What do we have to lose? And you know what, if we do it together, we have a much more likelihood of trying it. And if it doesn't, we have a great story to tell. And then get them to talk about exactly what change means. Because it's very easy to say, uh, nothing's ever gonna change, but let's tease that out. What exactly do you want to see change? Because maybe it's you want more streetlights in your neighborhood. That's much more possible than getting rid of all the illegal handguns in the city. That's going to be tough work. So like creating a theory of change, creating a tier of change, like what are the low hanging fruit that we can work together and keep using those words like together. And then what's that high end? What's the wish list that if we could stand or snap, the, the, the culture will change, the paradigm shift. But I think a lot of times people get so disillusioned because they, for lack of better words, are thinking so big. And, and, and sometimes you have to bring them down and go, let's talk about incremental change. Let's talk about this neighborhood first. Then let's talk about this section of the city. Then let's talk about the city and the state, the region, the country, the world, and allow them to see macro wins or micro wins and make them feel good about the small things that have happened to keep them motivated to go towards the big change. Thank you so much, Chris. I think that's, this is a nice place to end this on. I'm going to um, share my screen with everyone's contact info. Um, just give me one second here. Uh, this is the, these are the best email addresses to reach us at. Um, one second, if I can get this to figure it out. Okay, share. Beautiful. Um, so yeah, here are, here's how to reach everyone on this call. Um, this is recorded. So if you're, if you came in midway and, and want to hear the whole thing, this will be available on, uh, AHCJ's website for members shortly. Um, so feel free to, to go back and watch, but thank you everyone so much for queuing, um, uh, coming in today and, and listening to us chat and, and thank you, Chris, Abinay and Sammy, this has been this has been wonderful. I've learned a lot from you and I'm really grateful to, to have chatted with you today. No, I appreciate you creating the space and, and I've learned a lot too. And um, I'm, I'm going to look uh, Abene up <laughs> and hopefully we all just, just stay connected and continue to learn from each other. Because again, 
it's it's the change we want to see happens together. Absolutely. Thanks, thanks for having us, Caitlin. Thanks for putting it together. Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks, y'all.